I am about to present 30 hours of video that I am calling Liber Lux Galactica, which is a phrase of made-up language inspired by Latin that stands for the Book of Galactic Light. This work is inspired by the scrying sessions of Dr. John Dee and Edward Kelly from the late 1500s. Scrying is a means of communication with extra dimensional or extraterrestrial or celestial or angelic beings using psychic sights and a physical object. So in this case, we have uh, an obsidian mirror, much like Dr. John D. and Edward Kelly used. <clears throat> Every morning for 30 days, I woke up at about 3.30 a.m. I came up to this room, I said prayers, and I chanted uh, Enochian, the Enochian calls, which, uh, and then recorded what I saw and felt. Um, the result of this is what I am calling, or what the angels are calling, the Book of Galactic Light. The angels, uh, and they want to be acknowledged in these experiences. They, um, they want to be acknowledged. They want me to say that I alone did not write these. I did not make this up, um, although I did. You know, it is, it is an imaginal exercise. It is, it's using the faculties of imagination. And that's one of the, one of the things that is very important to understand is that all of these things are made up and yet they're very, very real. Um, <clears throat> and so I simply need to acknowledge that the angels, uh, the beings that I interacted with through this scrying stone, which is actually an illusion. I didn't interact with the beings through the scrying stone. I am a psychic dreamer, and I have had the capacity to see other realms, right? Just like everyone, actually. And everyone I've talked to, everyone I interact with, they say they will, they'll actually share their stories of where the paranormal, where the extraordinary breaks into their world and it's it's just sometimes one little thing. Sometimes they see a lot. Whatever it is, everybody I have ever met has some story like that where the extraordinary, where the divine, where uh, the bizarre can enter their lives. And so in that same way, I have had experiences of psychic visions, of dreams, of meditations, uh, of psychic mediumship, of energy work, and all these different things, all these different things um, that are somewhat natural capacities, somewhat developed capacities. But I'm talking about that because I am presenting a ritual that is complex. I am presenting the results of a ritual that is complex. The language here is extremely dense extremely difficult to work with and uh, all I'm doing right now is inviting you to have a an experience of we're engaging with this like a magical ritual actually I'm inviting you to participate in the magical ritual of vision magic of apocalypse working right I called for the apocalypse I want the new earth to come this world that we are in is a nightmare. We live in an empire of nightmare of our own creation, and therefore I am calling for its end. I call for the new earth, and I do so with love and light in my heart, and I want you to call for the new earth too in your own experience. And so if this, if this offering, the Liber Lux Galactica, can inspire you to explore your own path, beautiful. All of this stuff I'm doing, all of this stuff I've ever done, all of this working, it's empirical in nature. I didn't know what I set out to do. I was guided to do it. 
And in that same way, I know you're guided to do something very special <laughs> for the world. And it might look like this, and it might look like something else. Whatever it is, I want you to be doing it now from the point of view that you are all things, that you are God, that you have the power of creation within your heart, that you can do things that you think are simply magical. I want you to do that because the world needs you to do that now. And because everything else is simply an illusion that keeps us stuck in this nightmare empire. And let's break out of it. Let's break out of it. And we can. There's guidance. There's invitation. There's nothing holding us back except for ourselves. So I offer this as my way of uh, exploring this edge. Um, I know that it is very important to have examples to be initiated into these things, um, to, to know, hey, this is, this is possible, right? So I'm offering uh, 30 hours of uh, me chanting and knocking at this table and seeing, seeing all sorts of stuff and weeping and um, all sorts of stuff. Uh, I'll offer um, as much as I can because it is uh, very important for all of, all of us who have uh, the capacity to touch into the magical spheres, the magical aspects of our experience, it's very important that we do so now. The world wants us to. The world needs us to. And so let's do it. Let's do it. <clears throat> I want to tell the story of how I came here um, because I think it'll be really helpful actually and humanizing to a somewhat uh, difficult or challenging or complex um, experience. And so um, I'm not sure the best place to start, but um, <clears throat> I think actually where um, right here. Zoom in. There is a scar here. Scar matter right there. You can barely see it. But this is where... This is where the Enochian magic, Enochian vision magic, first really touched me. And this is a scar, actually, from <clears throat> uh, surgery, an emergency surgery um, <clears throat> performed with... Uh, this weird hospital room where the uh, clock kept going 12, 12, 12. I was sent there by a doctor named uh, John Constantine, uh, which was the same name of the comic book Exorcist, whose movie I watched the day before. It was a very strange experience. And I, I had this uh, big ball. It's like an infection, uh, I found out later, um, on my arm. And I was like, there's something wrong here. I didn't feel right. So I went in and... John Constantine says, oh, it's tennis elbow, don't worry about it, something like that. Um, he calls me like six times during the night. He's like, I think you're going to, I think it's a blood clot. You're probably going to die if it moves to your brain. Get to the hospital right away. They'll deal with it. So I get to the hospital. They uh, say, no, 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 it's an abscess. It's an abscess. It's uh, deep within your arm. It's some sort of infection. Uh, we need to cut open this abscess and drain it, and it's probably full of pus, right? And so... Uh, they start doing it, they cut very, very, very deep. It's three layers deep, so they injected it with um, a painkiller, cut it open, cut until I could feel it, inject again, cut until I feel it, inject again, cut until I feel it, inject again, and then they open up this wound that they thought would be full of pus. What they discovered was ancient infected blood mysteriously presented to my arm, and... It surprised them. Uh, <laughs> they were like, it seems like it was just teleported there. Like the other idea they had was I got scratched by a cat. Um, <clears throat> but I didn't have a scratch. So 
uh, there was a kind of a magical quality to it. And I said, you know what? <laughs> what can I do to prevent this from happening again? They said, yeah, well, it happens. People who get abscesses will keep getting them sometimes. Uh, and I said, yeah, all right. Uh, you don't know what's going on. This is probably a spiritual issue. I did a lot of a lot of spiritual things um, recently because I had just come back from a trip to Europe and I went to this European trip to connect to connect with the lands of my blood. Uh, so I went to England, Scotland, Hungary, Eastern European countries and didn't make it to Russia. These are all the different uh, places where my my uh, genetic lineages are from. But what I also did was uh, engage in a parapsychological inquiry about Dr. John D, who is the source of the Enochian magic. His work with the celestial beings, the angels, brought forth instructions that I have followed here with this holy table to engage in celestial communication. So I, I went there, I, I went to the British Museum to look at Dr. John Dee's magic mirror, his Sigillum de Ameth, uh, Mortlake, his place of residence. I went um, to Krakow. Uh, I engaged with uh, the places as much as I could on that trip with where he was and sort of followed his foot, foot, footprints. Uh, I, I opened myself up to dream world and I really opened myself up to communication from him, from, from there. And, uh, it was very, I mean, I, d during the museum visit, not much came through. Like it looked like just a obsidian mirror. I mean, maybe something happened, maybe something didn't. I have recordings of that since then I've been engaging in, uh, Captain Log style recordings of my emotions, feelings, observations, um, because that's part of the inquiry methodology. Um, Terra psycho psychological inquiry methodology comes from Dr. Craig Chalquist, who is my advisor at California Institute of Integral Studies. Terra psychological inquiry methodology just holds that the earth is conscious. Uh, you can engage in inquiry about place, about psyche with place, uh, through dreams, folklore, messaging, ob observation of actual places uh, as expressions or creative expressions of the deeper intelligence of the earth. So it's a way to engage, engage with it. And I, I actually think that this working is somewhat of a conclusion to that initial working I engaged in seven years ago. After I got back from Europe, after this infection, I said, oh my God, that's too much. Uh, I went to talk with my mentor in core shamanism, Teresa Morena, who was running uh, core shamanism drumming circles, also training in curanderismo, uh, Mexican faith healing traditions. Um, so I worked with her for uh, the core shamanistic practices, but also turned to her to help with this. And so we shut, we shut the portals. And she's like, there's definitely portals there. <laughs> um, definitely related to blood lineage. So let's shut this down until you're ready. Um, and it worked. I didn't get an infection again. Um, and since then, um, you know, I went this way and that way with my life. And seven years later or so, um, I got to a place in my life where I really needed to be honest with where I was with my heart, in my practice, um, in my vocation and work. So I got to a place where I no longer wanted to do the same patterns of uh, working for money. <laughs> And being sick of that and leaving and going to arts or hypnosis work and then not not being successful and then coming back and moving backwards and forwards and so i said you know what let's let's just cut through the matter let me let me be honest with my motivation with my vocation and i i made a sacred prayer to be of service to others in alignment with my uh, destiny mission and desire which 
is to work with extraterrestrial, extra-dimensional beings and the contact that humans can have with those deeper realms of being. Because it's beneficial, because it's amazing, because it's uh, fascinating, because this is the deeper reality that we are all experiencing and that only the empire of nightmare, the, the colonizers, the, uh, those who want to control us, those are the only people saying that uh, we're not in contact. <laughs> the indigenous people know. Uh, many people know we are in contact with and angels, with elementals, with extraterrestrial beings. We're in contact. They can help us. Uh, that, you know, they can help us see that the true nature of our reality is based in consciousness and not matter. Wow, that's amazing. It's a really big shift. We need some help understanding that. But once we understand that, our world starts to look different, our experience starts to feel different, and I now hold a tremendous amount of hope for our society, even where we are at now in this nightmare, uh, nightmare experience. <clears throat> So I said that prayer to be of service to others. I realize, you know, I'm very well trained for supporting contactees, experiencers, people who have been abducted or have missing time or uh, are star seas. I'm very well equipped to, to help them because I'm, I hold a master's degree in East-West psychology. I hold a bachelor's degree in the Western liberal arts tradition. I, I've gone deep into uh, Buddhist practices. I've uh, engaged with a lot of this. I've studied shamanism, psychic mediumship, energy work, faith healing, all sorts of stuff. I've done it. And so it doesn't, um, doesn't phase me, right? It, and I want to engage in it in a deeper way. And so I said, let's do it. Immediately after saying that prayer, I found guidance in my ear saying, Google CE5 Revelstoke, follow what's there. I did. I found uh, miraculously someone who had missing time experience. Uh, his name is Dan as well. Uh, missing time experience from a contact, contact uh, CE5, uh, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, uh, human-initiated contact experience where celestial beings, extraterrestrial beings interacted with him. He uh, was filmed going out. He was filmed coming back. He doesn't remember it. He said, oh, my God, I can't believe you're a hypnotist sitting across from me in my office. I knew a hypnotist would come one day into my life and I'd work with him to understand this experience, but I didn't look for them. He thought I was wanting to get in contact about CE5. I didn't really mention the hypnotism thing. I just, you know, whatever. And so... Uh, that was there, and that really, really, really opened my eyes and heart to the nature of extraterrestrial contact as psychic contact, as psycho-spiritual contact. Um, and I, I was able to use that experience because it's filmed, <laughs> you know, him going out and back. Uh, it's filmed, it's very objective. There was a UFO above the cloud, uh, above the crowd, or a group, you know, they're blinking. It was pre-programmed. Uh, they received messages through automatic writing saying this would happen through multiple double-blind sources, right? Like, so there's something very real happening. I said, this is real. This is just real. He's authentic. But there's something in his field, uh, aura, frequency, that makes me go, you know what? Psychic stuff's real. ETs are, yeah, I see them. I see them present within his field in his aura and it helped me understand what it means to read someone's aura it was like a rosetta stone experience and so he asked me to work with him on this what a beautiful opportunity and i realized that a regression to missing time with contact with these beings right because they exist outside of time in uh, specific ways uh, because they uh, are telepathic and psychic and things like that, will be not like a regression into physical memory, right? But into a different space, which feels potent. It felt like a potent invitation. It's not a regression. 
It's an invitation for deeper communion. Um, and I realized I needed power and energy to work with that because I was afraid of it. I was not sure how to relate to it. And so I remembered back to this arm, right? Shutting those portals. And I called up Teresa and I said, it's now time. Let's, let's redo it. Let's open those doors. I'm now, I now believe, I said, you know what? I can transmute that blood poison. I can transmute that blood infection. I'm not worried. I know. I know it. I know it. And if I do, if I am, so be it. So be it. If it happens, so be it, right? But I actually think that because of my prayer to be of service to others, because of my practice, because of my grounding into family, into the earth, into that way of life, that I achieve the capacity to transmute that ancient blood infection that was somehow magically transported into my arm through engagement with the Dr. John D. story. As that opened up, we did a beautiful ritual. My wife helped with it. Um, it was wrapped up in linens. These, this linen. <laughs> Some some of this linen actually wrapped me up in this experience of rebirth, and I, I felt reborn. Um, and that was important because that was an invitation to uh, bring in the deeper aspects of my consciousness. During this time, I, I was receiving a tremendous amount of information at a level that is below consciousness, below conceptual consciousness. So I received it felt like holographic, emotive psychic experiences that provided me an understanding of who I was, who I am, who I will be, what this work, this work is. And <clears throat> uh, it asked me for commitments. Right? Like, will, am I willing to do stuff like this? Right. And not, not, in, not in, not in so clear of terms. But uh, am I willing to continue my practice and serve in this way? And I said, yeah, I am. I am. I, there was really no choice in the matter. Um, I ended up, we ended up with uh, Dan, we ended up doing the regression. He ended up having uh, an experience of um, remote viewing what happened. And uh, he, you know, one of the more fascinating things, experiences he has to go very deeply into trance so that he doesn't remember it like he's sleeping and that he will uh speak what happened to him and then come back from the trance and then uh watch watch it watch the videos and uh we did it we got we got the information and he's he's had a issue with it he's not been able to watch it he holds he holds the USB thumb drive with the experience uncovered. And uh, I've talked to him about this. He's talked about it publicly. Um, and so it's, I'm not sharing anything out of confidence. Um, there's an immense invitation there. There's an immense invitation on the parts of the beings to engage. Uh, you know, it's like you can film and see it. They, you know, they, we could coordinate uh, sightings, the contact experience. I mean, he has already. Uh, so, you know, he, he's done that for myself, my wife. Uh, you know, these experiences, he took us up to Sail Mountain uh, at the end of August, which is really one of the uh, reasons why I'm here now, doing this work now. Because um, we... You know, I had thought, I had thought, you know, in terms of the engagement, right, that perhaps, um, perhaps this was related to Dr. John D. and Kelly. The, the work, uh, of me and Dan, uh, it's like I, I'm something like Dr. John D. He's something like Edward Kelly. The angels are something like the ETs. So that was my kind of working understanding of it. That's why I, I kind of opened up that door because I thought, hey, there's something in here. It's like, there is some sort of resonance. It's a karmic resonance. There's some sort of knowledge that can come through. There's, I mean, to, to have such a, a psycho, psycho, it is psychosomatic, but a somatic expression of that resonance in this arm experience, which was 
magical and scary at the same time, revealed to me that the story of John D is is potent for me. And so to work with that and him in this way, I thought, okay, this is something like that then. We'll do that now, right? Um, and I kept going, dude, look at the video, look at the video, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. And um, at the end of uh, let's do it, meaning let's let's put you in a trance and invoke contact with extraterrestrial beings to, I don't know, have a conversation, build rapport, and then establish a time and place to meet <laughs> at a deeper level, to bring in those frequencies, to bring in this knowledge that uh, those beings are kind, they respect our free will, they're not here to take our stuff, they're here simply to help be an, of, being of assistance because actually we're family with them. Actually, we are them at some level. And so they're here to help in a way that's kind and respectful, in a way that you might help your child learn and develop, not by doing the task for them, but by supporting them so that they grow up and mature. So we did a CE5, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, at the top of Sail Mountain. We saw beautiful light ships move in the sky. We saw um, all sorts of stuff happened. All sorts of the radios, radios were going off, um, psychic messages. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> but one of the most potent experiences I had, actually, was uh, in the daytime. And the experience was of... Uh, it happened after breakfast. It happened after breakfast. Um, everybody went away from our campsite. I found myself alone. I said, thank God, now I can sit down in meditation. I sat down in meditation, and 10 minutes passed. Uh, people came back. My wife came back. Uh, two of the participants came back and said, oh my goodness, didn't do you know what happened? We saw a Tic Tac. We saw a Tic Tac UFO. It went like this. It flew across the sky. Well, definitely a Tic Tac UFO. It's not, there's, it was long enough. It stayed here long enough for us I, to know that it wasn't uh, anything else besides uh, a UFO. And I said, oh my goodness, I'm so excited for you. I mean, a daytime sighting is so unique and so wonderful. Why didn't you call me? <laughs> Why didn't you call me? And they said, we did. We yelled. You didn't hear it. You didn't come. Whatever. And I said, what? I was in camp. What What was I doing? And I said, you know what I was doing? I was having an interaction with a being that was here in my face that had a sort of gravity to it that I learned how to recognize from my psychic mediumship training. This is where they present. The spirits present when I'm channeling or uh, doing mediumship work. And I don't do that often. I, it's very, very, very rare. It's only in the training that I really got deep into it. But there, it's there. I recognize. Oh, okay, so um, that being had a communication and said to me to make a recording uh, about my thoughts and feelings related to Dr. John D., Edward Kelly, Dan Berg, and Dan Rekshan. Right? <laughs> That's me. Um, said to uh, explore that further, provided this sort of information. It felt sort of, it flowed in, it flowed in. There was information that flowed in. I immediately talked to Dan Berg afterwards. We drove to Revelstoke and back. Uh, I was just laid it all out. I was like, there's, there's this guy, uh, John D. He was from the 15th century. He had a magic mirror. He looked into it, had contact. He was at the center of the British Empire. I had this arm infection thing. Somehow we're connected. I don't know how. He's like, all right, all right. That's interesting. <laughs> like, where do, you, where do you go from there? So I... Um, I, uh, where do we go from there, right? Like, we had that communication. We had another day of CE5, right? Uh, you know, we talked about moving uh, forward with, uh, like, feeling of the regression, with moving these patterns forward. Beautiful, wonderful. Um, and then I realized, right, I, from there, actually, that moment of connection uh, drove me forward. It, 
it presented something like, um, and I didn't really understand what was happening to me until after the fact, right? So um, I opened up to contact in a very real way. The spirit came to me, um, which I actually, you know, in my fantasies, think it was John D. I think it was John D. He came bzz, right there, so you know, blasted me with some information uh, and said, "Keep looking, right? Keep looking." And it's like, all right, so I did. I started looking into it. I started exploring it, um, <clears throat> and uh, I felt it's it, there was an intensity to the experience. It was very, very intense. It was sort of like uh, magnetic white light, you know, sort of, uh, I I would like wake up really early. I read thousands of pages. I did a lot of study. Um, this table, all these things came up and out of it. And um, I, I started identifying that it was this sort of magnetic white light experience because when I did the, th when I got to major steps and places, I felt this immediate sense of relief. I was like, oh, thank God. Oh, thank God. Um, and I felt like I was able to be present with my family here and now in this lifetime. In this lifetime. <clears throat> One of the uh, understandings I have with this is there is past life karmic resonance between myself, Dr. John D. There is. There is. There's no way that a blood infection could be trans transported uh, through a magic mirror over the span of four centuries without something like that happening. Um, I see a tremendous amount of resonance between the specific symbols and qualities of his life and my life. And I'm sure a lot of you do, too. That's totally fine. I, you know, I went through, uh, I had to, I had to, uh, engage with this material at the level it was engaging with me. And one of those ways was through uh, what I can only term as past life memory or past life resonance with Dr. John D. I went uh, ahead and I did a regression on this matter after I, after I felt, you know, sort of energy. I couldn't, I couldn't move forward in a way uh, I knew that this story was somehow a blocker to me. I knew that I I wouldn't be able to stand on two feet in this world here and now without going into the darkness, going straight to the nightmare and facing it and facing it because there was indeed a nightmare aspect to it because it is very important to realize that the expressions in the 1500s, the John D. Edward Kelly, they had aspects that were very expressive of colonialism. There is blood on their hands. There is blood on their hands. And I'm not talking about uh, blood magic ritual. I'm talking about the very real blood of the indigenous population of North America. I'm talking about the very real blood of the wage slaves. I'm talking about everyone who's been victimized. Uh, I'm talking about the, the destruction to our environment that came about because of the actions of the British Empire, of which John Dee inspired. He inspired the British Empire. He was, he, they say he coined those terms, the British Empire, right? And if you, if you tune in to some of the hidden subtext. There's no evidence for it, but if you tune in with your feeling state, you might actually tune into a sort of blood ritual. I mean, that's what they, that's what some of the fiction now, I'm thinking of the dark lines of London, right? Where fiction can, can take realities that we don't know yet in, into this world and, and explore them. And so I think that's what happened. I think some, some blood ritual happened to start the British Empire. And I'm not, I'm not offering this as scholarship. I'm saying explore this notion. But the very real fact that the British Empire was born up and out of this celestial contact experience and that there is blood on the hands of all those involved, right? 
it's it's not debatable whether or not the 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 world is in a nightmarish state of existence right it is the environment is being destroyed people are being exploited there are tremendous amount of wars for empires whose values we don't even know that are not shared with the people and so I realized I had to go into that nightmare, whatever that was, whatever that was. I had to do that. If I was John D., so be it. I need to move on with my life so that I can be present with my family and love and peace and creativity so that I can paint pictures and make flutes, which is something I really like doing. I just needed to do that, and I did. I did a regression. I did a regression with Sonia Wilder, and I chose her because Dolores Cannon told her to work with me through her gifts of psychic mediumship. Right? <laughs> so, so we had done a regression, and I was like, you know what? I, I hear you have a historical past life, uh, and she had this past life with Montgomery Clift, right? And I was like, maybe you can help me out. I think I'm resonating with John D. I, I need some help. So she helped me. We went, we did a regression. Uh, I'll be sharing it. Um, and it was from the point of view of thinking myself as John D., Dan Berg as Edward Kelly, and that we needed to engage in some sort of ambassadorial remote viewing experience with the Galactic Federation. That's what I thought. <laughs> Right? So they were like, okay, okay, so yeah, you're definitely John D. Unequivocally, yes, you're John D. That's what the regression said. However, right, before you go, oh, how is that even possible? I, you know, I need to acknowledge that the uh, expression, the expression here of <clears throat> being something, you can be many different things in many different ways. Right? So there can be many different people. What is past life? We don't even know. So there is a sort of sense that there is indeed a unifying consciousness throughout these experiences. But I actually, as a past life regressionist, as a Buddhist, I don't know how past life work. And I'm pretty sure it's not through the linear Oh, John D. died, and it was someone else, someone else, someone else, and now he's me. It's not like that. It's sort of perhaps like wave interference patterns and amplification patterns and destructive and constructive interference patterns. And I think it's actually something like that. And so there is indeed, yes, there is that connection. And I also received information that I certainly was not the intelligence that encoded the ciphers and the codes within his material whatsoever. So that was sort of a relief to me. And the other part of this regression said, do this work, do this ritual. Do it in weeks, not months. And if it's difficult, you're on the wrong path. Just do it. And so I followed that um, through studying. And I was like, what is this ritual? How do I relate to it? I started working with a, a study group. I called together a, a group of people to work with me to uh, explore these matters, and that was very fruitful. Um, another another person, my the, the Beyond Quantum Healing founder, also was <laughs> directed by Dolores Cannon to participate. And there was so some level of uh, resonance. Hey, there's something real happening here. Here, that's real in a psychic way, a real in a psychic medium way. Um, and that's totally fine. Let's go with it. I mean, I'm not doing harm. And I'm experiencing greater peace at, as each step of the way. One of the uh, most beautiful things was after the regression, we got noticed that we could move into this house here, right? So, and, and that had felt like a very challenging thing. So I noticed each step of the way there was relief and my life could move forward just that much more. In fact, I've, I've shifted patterns that uh, I never thought I could shift because of this work. Patterns relating to money and finance and 
depression and relation to the earth and all sorts of stuff is shifted. And so I started working with this material and uh, it took me about a month or two to wrap my mind around what this Enochian vision magic ritual is. What is this? And I had this understanding that it was somehow used to invoke the apocalypse. So I was like, okay, I have to do this work. Uh, my instruction is to do this work that it's going to work, right? So how how am I going to it's like, it's invoke the apocalypse? What is this crazy talk, <laughs> right? Um, I think I done it. I think it's accomplished. It's, it's you know, it's, it's an, and not just in a psychological uh, place. It's, it's actually real magic. <laughs> like this is real magic in a way. And yet the thing that I did was guided, right? So it was guided. Um, and the reason why I say this is because of the experiences I've had in working with uh, my dreams, with the, the matter, um, you know, to call forth a study group and have... Uh, you know, Candace come come in and say, you know, Dolores Cannon told me to participate in this. You know, it's like, oh, there's something real. I had 15 people sign up for it. Uh, I thought two or three would sign up for it, right? So um, I started working with all of this, and I, I started needing to put together these things and uh, kind of a ritual book and understanding, and I really went with the guidance that if it's hard, it's it's, it's the wrong path, right, that I'm guided. Right. I had these dreams of white light, uh, oftentimes that I would wake up from. It's just pure, undifferentiated white light that had a tremendous amount of intelligence in there. And I would just start talking to my wife at like 3 or 4 a.m. About, about like ancient magic or obtuse philosophy or something like that. And so um, I, I had a bunch of guidance around receiving information and processing through and setting this up. And setting this up, and it, I'm going to talk. I, I'm talking about that guidance because uh, some of the actions I've done are, aren't necessarily in alignment with the direct instructions as provided. For instance, the the whole table here is not of the exact material that uh, the angel so John D and Kelly to work with. The gold, I don't own any gold. <laughs> I, I own gold paint, right? This is this is made like an art project. This is made like an art project because I'm an artist. That's, that's who I am. I'm not a I'm not a magician. I'm not a ceremonial magician. I'm not initiated into those things. And yet I'm being called to offer initiation to you. I've been called to initiate myself into these magics because it's important now to have a stream of magic that is active, alive, grounded within tradition, that is capable of being of service to us here and now. And that is, that's what's happening. I got to a point <clears throat> where I realized I had to do this before the solstice of 2021, the winter solstice. So I had 30 days. Uh, people talk about the expedited not, uh, apocalypse working as a 49-day experience. So you do 19, the 19 calls of the uh, 19 Enochian calls, which are basically just phrases of the Enochian language, which is a... It's basically a made-up language that Edward Kelly and John Dee received in magical ways from the angels that have different syllables and meanings, and there's a whole lot to discuss about that. But there, there are 19 calls, which are chants that you do that will invoke the presence of these beings and work the magic. So you do 19 of them, uh, one each day, there's one that's silent, uh, and then you do the 19th call 30 times, right? So that 30 times, once for each aether, an aether is a level of consciousness or of, of the heavens. And each of those aethers is associated with three or four governors, which are angelic beings, something like that, 
um, whose names are like spelled out in squiggle kind of uh, crossword style ways. So that's the instruction, 49 days. I didn't have enough time. I, I mean, maybe I did just barely. But they said, you know what? Just do the 19 calls and change the last one, each one. So you can do it in 30 days, right? Just like they said, I was like, uh, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I don't actually have two cubits square of wood. I only have a cubit or so of, of sweet wood, <laughs> Right, so I don't even have the material, and I can I can go out, but I've got work to do in the week. I don't have enough time, and they, you know, they the guidance to just work with what you've got. And I, I went with that, and this is a very beautiful setup uh, of Enochian temple furniture that I've made from things that I had. Right, so this is linen cloth that my wife wrapped me in as part of a rebirth ceremony. That was part of the. A studio gallery space I ran in Oakland, California. I'd put that out and singing bowls would be put on top and people might lay down on them and have experiences. Um, uh, the beeswax here in the Sigillum de Ameth is uh, beeswax my brother bought to make uh, figure, figurines out of. And we made candles out of and I've carried around this hunk of beeswax for five years, right? And I use that. So it's, it's sort of like that. So they guided me to this um, ritual, and they did it. They did it. Um, they did it. Uh, and I discovered, right, not much different than before, uh, but there is a, a really a strong actual connection I have uh, that wasn't new because of the ritual, but deepened. And so I'm talking about this because I want to invite and inspire you to do something like this on your own. Not this unless you're called to, right? Whatever you're called to do, do it. Wherever you're invited to go, go there. Because it's needed now. Um, so I've talked a lot about my story. Um, I should reflect a little bit about my relationship with John Dee and that past life experience, right? My understanding now is much more expanded of what a human being is, what past lives are, right? Like I said, there is a sort of kind of perhaps constructive wave pattern associated with that. Not, I was that there, I am this now. Because actually, when I, I will say this in terms of the ritual, it showed me the true nature of who I am, who all of you are, what all of this is. It is God creating him and herself all the time, everywhere, all at once. That is the true reality of our being. We are God. It is one. There's no other truth besides that. Everything else is an illusion. And so with that understanding, right, that it's all one, and it's happening in mind. It's happening in mind or consciousness or heart or love. It's not happening in ping pong kind of pool ball style matter kind of bouncing off of each other. It's actually happening in something like a dream experience, right? Where it's all at once, all happening. And in that way, to say, I am Daniel... John D was John D and there's some sort of connection between us. Of course there's a connection. Because there's a connection between everyone, everywhere, all at once. And does that matter? Does this past life matter in that way? Can I say I am that? No. 
Absolutely not. That was the instruction I got in the regression. You can't even say you're John D. You were John D. You can't say you're you were John D. It's just interesting. It's sort of like um it's like who am I? What am I? Right? All these questions come up. Um <clears throat> I know that working this experience from that perspective, right? I had to start this experience with the understanding that perhaps I might invoke an apocalypse in that 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 apocalypse might actually be needed in this world to move forward to alleviate suffering to bring us into the new earth of love and light that that apocalypse might actually need to be invoked and thinking i don't know how many thousands of people have stared at that magic mirror but i don't know how many people received mysterious ancient infected blood in their arms that was exercised or like, like re pulled out in these sort of ominous ways. Like, I don't know how many people that has happened to. And to honor the specialness of that potential connection, I, I had to invoke the apocalypse using a 500-year-old technique given to very strange and complicated men by what appears to be devious angelic entities, right? <clears throat> I, I needed to, to engage in this from that point of view. It's going to work, right? It's like, I, I, part of me goes like, what if, what if, what if I'm the only one, right? What if I am Jandi? What if I am Jandi? What if this, this, arm infection shows me there's something back there that needs to be addressed now and that actually that provided a bridge between the times where this working now can be effective and what if what if i don't do that because i'm afraid of of going oh i'm you know some sort of hubris or something like that so i said you know what for the next whatever, I'm just going to do it as if it is the thing, as if I'm invoking the apocalypse. I need to do this as if I can. That was the instruction I received from my higher self in the hypnotic regression. And so I did. And, uh, you know, as someone who uh, cares about the principle of non-harm, cosmic law of one, I want everyone to be uh, happy. <laughs> That's that's my that's my religious commitment. Is it's really is is really uh, I've taken vows on this. Like it's that's my purpose. That's my mission. Uh, that's how I express my spirituality in the world. Is to be of service to others for the cessation of cessation of suffering, so that we enjoy happiness. That's it. That's it, right? And that um, that's what I was called to do here. I do want to honor that Daniel that went before this ritual um, <clears throat> by, by appreciating the level of courage it took, right? I remember actually starting this work and I didn't know who I was going to interact with, really. Uh, I kind of had this notion that perhaps I would say these Enochian calls in this other language and the obsidian mirror would like would like phase out and it would be a window to another world i thought that might happen i thought you know maybe demons would show up i thought maybe oh uh et's nefarious et's that were devious would show up uh, i thought maybe it was actually angelic communication and i i remember talking a lot about fear of God, about being uh, respectful of the possibility, the, the range of possibility. Because people do say, hey, this Anakian magic works, it's dangerous, right? You've got to know what you're doing or something like that. And here I was going like, I'm doing this because past life memory tells me the same past life connection that brought forth a blood infection that was mysterious, like... But I have to do it. So 
I went ahead and I did it. And <clears throat> I remember after doing the first day of ritual, actually, like my heart pounding, I go, oh, it's not any of those things that I was afraid of, right? It is something like shamanic journey work. It's something like dreaming. It's something like the hypnotic work I do with clients. It's nothing different than that. It's just, I am receiving this vision. I mean, I, I don't see, I haven't, when I have the experience this year, I'll say, I'm seeing this, I'm experiencing this, I'm out of my body, I'm in space. I'm actually very present in my body, in trance, and I'm not seeing physically with my physical eyes. I'm not going there with my physical body. I am having an experience that is assisted these angelic forces, these celestial beings really do show up in frequency. Their sort of wave pattern shows up and all of a sudden my patterns become entrained. Right? It's entrained. And there's some sort of order to the experience. And I say, oh, I see this. And I, I saw it through here and here not here. That's very important to understand. <clears throat> so, I mean, I did the ritual. I was really relieved to have the experience of connecting in with... Was, I, I was really relieved to have the experience of connecting in with aspects of myself, right? I was challenged to expand my habitual identity from this thing, right? Like, I am a human looking forward, being very sort of, I am Daniel doing this to go, ah, yes, there's this body here. There's this persona. Yes, but there's also connections everywhere to everything all at once. And it's, it's actually such a relief. Um, I mean, halfway through or so, they started telling me, like, don't worry about stuff so much. Like, like, did you know? I mean, we're both the same thing. It's like a cell in the body saying, dear, dear brain, you know, if, 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 if my, well, some of my skin cell needs food, it talks through mysterious ways. And receives that energy from the whole system. It's like the same thing. It's like these angels are us. We're them. We're God. Um, and that that's a relief. Um, and so it is now time to take down the Enochian furniture. Uh, and I wanted to um, go through this with you because we went through it together. Or you will have the experience of watching me engage with this. You may actually engage with it yourself. So um, there's a sense of nostalgia actually present, a sense of uh, I'll miss them, but I know that uh, they're actually present here now that uh, this isn't necessary to contact the celestial realms actually just this is desire openness and uh some concepts is, is is helpful really the concept that you are those things that you seek to contact and some concepts around how your mind identifies with things so that's really helpful to understand and um, there's many opportunities to explore and this is the white linen there's a prayer shawl Golden Lamin, which was hung around the neck, and it served to conciliate me with the holy table, which conciliates heaven and earth.
the ring of Pele, who works wonders. This ring was put on the finger, this, and is a, an effective principle of the working. This. This is from my Shambhala Buddhist practices. This is given as an accomplishment of a contemplative arts practice. So I wear this in respect of my uh, Shambhala Buddhist lineage, but also as a, an identifier that this whole activity is a, an activity of art as much as it is of magic. This here held up the held up the mirror and it says in love and light only for the benefit of all. The magic mirror. This is black obsidian from Mexico. <clears throat> this belongs in a sacred place. This is the red silk. It's actually cotton. With golden tassels. So are the end signs of creation, each representing a planetary body. It's a talisman of sorts. This here is the um, Sigillum de Ameth. <clears throat> Underneath here I place this blue selenite which has been charged with the energies of uh, CE5 contact. Um, this was placed in a snow spiral um, last year um, that my wife and I walked to sing mantras uh, with Dan Berg, actually, in our first uh, CE5 experience with him. So that was, a, that was their present. <clears throat> this is a, an old dress. Uh, my wife was given by my aunt, actually, uh, and served as the uh, red carpet.
These are smaller Siglundanas. And they sat underneath the holy table's legs to sort of provide a insulation. One, two, three, four. There's a few more things. Um, I'll go get them. <clears throat> Table of Union. The round table of Nalvej. And then the elemental tables. Watchtowers. These are <clears throat> here my learning uh, learning uh, cards I placed around the room uh, to reference the archangels on my right hand, Mikael, as part of the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. I placed these around the room so I could orient myself in space and time. <clears throat> um, and this here is my chant book. Uh, I'd love to go through it, actually, as a way of initiation and, uh, yeah, as part of the experience right, of working with these. <clears throat> and so... Uh, I start with the four dharmas of Gempopa. Grant your blessing so that my mind may be one with the dharma. Grant your blessing so that dharma may progress along the path. Grant your blessing so that the path may clarify confusion. Grant your blessing so that confusion may dawn as wisdom. Continue on to a refuge, um, taking refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. This is really uh, in honor of my uh, Buddhist practice and vows and sets the whole context 
um, because one of the understandings that I had or intuitions I had about this ritual is that I, it might be something like Padma Sambhava bringing um, Buddhism to Tibet. When, when he arrived in Tibet, he needed to interact with the uh, magical forces there and subjugate uh, a lot of the energy. So I thought perhaps I might be bringing Buddhism to these otherworldly beings that interacted with John Dee and uh, Edward Kelly. Little did I know they would be teaching me things uh, about Buddhism. So uh, Then I continued on to the lesser banishing ritual of the penta pentagram. This is the ritual that involves this sort of thing in the corners of the rooms and saying, before me, Raphael, and uh, going, Yodhe, Vahe, um, that sort of thing. Uh, and it is uh, in this ritual primarily because of its uh, significance to ceremonial magic and because of its uh, physical representation of the rose cross right here and here, rose cross. Um, and that is in, that's that specifically references uh, John Dee's influence. Um, so it is uh, sort of both a, a nod to the work after John Dee and to John Dee, and also uh, a way for me to engage with the um, ceremonial ritual magic aspects that uh, are uh, Western tradition. I continue um, through the ritual in prayer, uh, and I compose a multi-page prayer. This is really uh, the most heartfelt I could, um, thinking that perhaps, that you know, this is going to work, but uh, my role as a human being is to invoke the angels and these different beings, the, to call them in. For what purpose? Well, for what I asked them to, right? So that's the trick. That's how to get through this sort of ordeal of magical working is to have a motivation and intention that is universally acceptable, yet also specific enough to be meaningful. And so this is what I, I uh, attempted to do, which is really asking for a aid, assistance, and healing from the celestial realms here and now, to invite them here and now to work according to the principle of non-harm and the cosmic law of one for the benefit of all beings. So those are the kind of criteria of this invitation. And uh, really they, you know, they, they respond and they can do it. And so in this prayer, I uh, make a sacred prayer uh, and I continue on. Um, and you'll, you'll see what it is. Um, from this point of view, after I go through uh, my own personal prayer, I do the opening prayer that teach me, O creator of all things, to have correct knowledge and understanding for your wisdom is all that I desire. Speak your word in my ear, O creator of all things, and set your wisdom in my heart. So this is a prayer that uh, Chandi did with this. <laughs> And it goes on through uh, a prayer associated with the ring of Pele um, and prayer with the lamb. And you'll get into that as you see the materials. We've got uh, this work now that chants the perimeter of the holy table. And then uh, the, the central square chanting it. Um, <clears throat> going... Then it chants the uh, 49 angel names of the 49 angels on the Siglum de Ameth. Um, this is all put together. Um, I've looked significantly to the Enochian Vision Magic book of uh, Duquette. Um, and there's other references, but that seem consistent and easy and also grounded in scholarship. So... Uh, that was consistent with the instructions I received from the angels. Um, continue on through whispering the names of the round table of uh, knowledge and also the the corner of the corners in the four continents. So 
Then we get into the Enochian calls themselves, which look, that's an example of um, the Enochian script, uh, a transliteration, and then the translation. Um, the translation was provided by the celestial beings through the scrying of John D. and Kelly after the fact. So they received some chunk of the text and then the translation afterwards. It is consistent. Uh, you can read it, um, speak it, that sort of thing. Uh, it goes through a lot of chants. Uh, and then we, I get to this table of the 38ers with yeah, the governor's names. Uh, so Lil, the first Aether, which is the centermost Aether, uh, and governors one, two, and three, Akodon, Pascom, and Valgars, right? So there's sounds like gibberish, um, but it has some significance. I would then do the call of the 30 Aethers, replacing um, the, the word uh, for the number of the Aether with the appropriate one. Continue on, continue on, continue on. And then I would um, chant the names of the governors to actually invoke their presence. And I had a specific prayer um, to invite them here and now into this world to be of service. Um, I would do the closing that uh, was associated or came from John D. Uh, banishing ritual of the pentagram. Then the four limitless ones in the dedication of merit, both of those chants are Buddhist in nature, and they are there to set this whole context into the Mahayana tradition. So this is the tradition of being of service to others for the benefit of beings. And this is, uh, this sort of dedicates the merit, meaning, uh, letting it go, letting it be of benefit to others karmically as well as in some, some action like this, letting it go. So that's the chant book. Um, this is all, all, all this material. I'm not sure where it's going to live. Um, the holy table, um, it is holy in a sense. <clears throat> the last two things I wanted to talk about <clears throat> are uh, these, and these will be present in many of the videos. These are uh, shortwave radios um, that are tuned to a frequency 144.101. This is put forward, uh, this is uh, an expression of the radio contact methodology, sometimes called CE6, so close encounters of the sixth kind, or but it's, it's really set within the context of human initiated contact. So we say, hey, please contact us. And you can do so by communicating on these radios. And it's very similar to like pendulum or other modes of physical expression. But in this case, um, we know if they're, both radios are tuned to the same frequency, they're both on, they should receive the same amount of radio chatter if there's radio waves flowing through or whatever. Both of them should go on at the same time. Um, generally, uh, if one is going on and the other is not, something funny is happening. Uh, and <clears throat> so you'll see this sort of chit-chat. I've engaged with conversations with them saying, give me, give me a sign for yes, a sign for yo, no, a sign for maybe. Let's have communications. And they actually, you know, uh, communicate that way. They communicate that way. <clears throat> Uh, and so I had them on in the corner of the room. I had them on in the corner of the room primarily uh, to have video of some sort of gravity. It's like, uh, it's amazing. It's strange. It's bizarre that they would communicate in this way. Um, and they did. And it's amazing. And... Uh, I felt, I mean, you'll see them. It's like sometimes something weird is happening. You're like, oh, this is, this is a uh, fluke or whatever. But there was a lot of consistency in terms of how they communicated. Uh, there was a lot of chatter. 
when I would chant uh, the Enochian letters, um, and you know, the, it was kind of not disruptive when I was scrying, that sort of thing. So that was present and is offered um, as is, you know, as an invitation for further exploration. None of this stuff, none of this stuff, it, I'm asking you to take my word for or to even understand that my uh, scrying or the messaging I get uh, should be taken on faith. Absolutely not. It, it is strictly an invitation for you to uh, have a similar experience by either listening to the chants or by having a dreamlike experience of your own, listening to the, the visions I'm expressing. Um, or to have some other engagement that you're invited to. There was information that came through. It was like, they talked a lot about portals. They talked a lot about densities. They talked a lot about how to relate to other celestial beings. And so um, that's important to know that there's a deeper invitation here. Um, <clears throat> and... That's what I would love to leave you with, is just a sense of invitation, a sense of possibility, a sense of uh, knowing where the journey might lead, which is to yourself. Right? There's no other place it'll lead. There's no reason to be scared. It will lead to a deeper connection with yourself in peace, love, and unity consciousness. That's it. If you are not embodying peace, love, and unity consciousness at the end of any contact experience or any journey like this, then you need to continue on your path until you are there. Because that is the beginning, end, and ground of the path. That's it. And so I invite you to uh, greater experience, I invite you to your own experience and I will say thank you for being open to the possibilities, open to inspiration, open to this example, but thank you more for having the courage of walking your own path, for connecting in with yourself, for the benefit of your world. Thank you. Amen.